Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Star Wars The Bad Batch Season 3, Episode 8, Bad Territory. An episode that made me feel like I was back in my swampy homeland of Florida, where the pontoon boats do have pod racer engines, and there are actual mines around Mar-a-Lago, I'm pretty sure. Fennec Shand is back, and let's talk about who her mysterious client is, along with some connections to Jedi Fallen Order in this episode. We open on everyone's favorite sushi spot, Pabu. Omega cradles her calm, waiting for word from Echo. Like, you know, those of us who, like, refresh our apps on our phones, waiting for a notification. Please, please, please respond. Since Echo rescued Rex and the rest of the clones at the end of last season, it seems like the two squads have parted ways with Rex and Echo continuing their fight against the Empire, but Omega feels guilty for getting the clones killed in the last two episodes. R.I.P. Fireball, Endemic, Greer, Samson, and everyone else who bit the dust. They get a communication from Fee Genoa. Omega describes her to Crosshair as a liberator of ancient wonders, a phrase that Fee used to describe herself in the season two episode of Entombed. I prefer liberator of ancient wonders. Before admitting, you know, that she's little more than a pirate. Last we saw Fee, she was saying goodbye to her clone crush of Tech as the Bad Batch left to track Hemlock's ship. And she does mention Tech this episode, so she knows that he's dead, but you know, she doesn't seem that sad about it. Fee has been doing a little digging into the nature of M Count and informs them that the Empire has put out a bounty for M-Count targets. It's almost like we are back in the Clone Wars episode Children of the Force, when Palpatine slash Sidious enlisted Cad Bane to kidnap Force-sensitive children to train as Sith spies. In general, these high M-Count targets would be, at this point in history, hunted by Inquisitors for either recruitment or just, you know, slaughter. Fee mentions Class 1 bounty hunters, hinting at a rating system for bounty hunters, and we have to imagine that Fennec Shan and Cad Bane would rank pretty high during this era. Boba Fett would still be a little young, but, you know, he would be working his way up that ranking. Omega suggests that they hit up Finnick Shan for intel about this M-Count bounty call. So yes, Finnick Shan is back! First introduced in The Mandalorian Season 1, Finnick Shan, Ming-Na Wen, was such a cool character. She didn't return in the Book of Boba Fett, but she had an arc in Season 1 of Bad Batch where she attempted to capture Omega actually twice, once in the episode Cornered and then later in that season in Bounty Lost. While she was seen as an antagonist, she was ultimately working for Nala Se, who was just trying to keep Omega out of the hands of Lama Su. Finnick Shan had a particularly eventful duel with Cad Bane over Omega on Bora Vio. Hunter and Wrecker leave to find Finnick Shand while Omega and Crosshair are left behind on Pabu, with Hunter tasking Omega to try to help Crosshair repair that injured hand. Hunter and Wrecker arrive at this very, very cool looking space station. This place looks awesome. From the exterior, it looks kind of similar to Frankie's Hotel and Casino from Star Wars Resistance. There are some cool details that I want to talk about in the establishing shot of the interior. On the far left, we get what looks like a pair of muggers waiting for an easy mark to walk down their alley. Then there's a plethora of droid cameos. We see an appearance of the cute waddling LE droids, which made several appearances in Star Wars Resistance. There's a little pit droid running down the street. Actually, there are a lot of pit droids this episode. They're like everywhere. Finally, as Hunter and Wrecker walk down the street, they pass what appears to be a Vanguard Axis droid throwing someone out of a seedy establishment. The Vanguard Axis was a droid cartel involved with the Wookiee slave trade, which showed up in the season two episode Tribe. These droids are also present in the bar the clones enter, so I think it's safe to say that the Vanguard Axis controlled part of this town. Indeed, maybe the entire space station is run by them, which would explain just the heavy droid presence. Like this whole place is like, yeah, yeah, droid Gatra, we have rights. There's a pit droid bartender and he's wearing a tall pointed hat with goggles. I don't know, given how tall the hat is, I wonder if it was made for the race of Kiati Mundi. We can see a sign for the Corellian Engineering Corporation. That would be the same shipbuilding company that produced the Millennium Falcon, as well as the Ghost and the various other ships on the window behind the booth with the Rodian talking to Fennec, reminding me a lot of the Rodian Greedo talking to Han Solo. That neon sign reads VIP Lounge. Also, there's a pink neon sign for what seems to be advertising a blurg burger? Just like a blurg between two buns? Would we just call this a blurger? We should. The fact that there's an entire blurg carcass between these buns is a little intense. It'd be like a picture of a burger from planet Earth, but with like a dead cartoon cow between the buns. I think I would still eat that. As Hunter and Wrecker approach, a fight breaks out between an Aqualish and a Pantoran. This couple reminds me of the big Mos Eisley Cantina scene in A New Hope, where the Aqualish Pondo Baba took a dislike to Luke Skywalker, starting a bar fight that ended in his bloody, bloody amputation. The bottle of booze on the countertop has a label of A, while the pit droid bartender has to end the fight, I like how those security droids don't do anything. Fennec agrees to provide information on the MCAT bounties if Wrecker and Hunter agree to help her. I haven't done one of those jobs myself, but I might know someone who has. Ooh, you know someone who has? Is it Cad? I kind of hope Finnick and Cad have like made peace and started like hooking up. Actually, I think it is someone else who gets revealed at the end of this episode. In general, I just love the green purple lighting of this bar because it's just so synthetic compared to the organic, dirty, grimy earth tones where we spend the rest of the episode. Meanwhile, AZ checks out Crosshair's hand and says that there's nothing else physical he can do to heal him. There is some deeper psychological factor at work here. If you were to elaborate more on the experimentation you were subjected to, I could 
could determine the cause. <sighs> Forget it. He's so defensive. Why is Crosshair so ashamed of what Hemlock did to him? I wonder if there's something Crosshair knows that he's still too ashamed to tell Omega and us about. I don't think he's a double agent screwing them over, but I do think it was at least a matter of maybe at some point he really wanted to be a successful test subject for Hemlock and he was just ashamed for wanting it. So on Phoenix ship, Wrecker and Hunter are briefed on their target, Sylar Saris, the Slayer of Ordo Eris, who is wanted for killing some Hexian brood bosses. So it looks like Sylar Saris might be a Yamri race, which is based on the praying mantis. We first saw one of these designed for the Mos Eisley Canteen in the background of the 1977 Star Wars. But to the Slayer of Ordo Eris, Sylar had spent some time in the arena pits that we saw in the Jedi Fallen Order game. In that game, Cal was briefly kidnapped and forced to fight in the Ordo Eris arena before he was able to escape, and that arena was run by the Hexian Brood, which is a crime syndicate located on Ordo Eris. In Fallen Order, they were led by Sork Tormo. Ordo Eris, by the way, was an asteroid space station that headquartered the Hexian Brood Syndicate, built in the asteroid remnant of Polis Masa, which is the same band of asteroids that included the safe haven that Obi-Wan and Yoda went back to with the medical facility where Luke Skywalker and Leia were born in Revenge of the Sith. So Finnick has located Sylar on a planet with toxic air. And while this planet doesn't get named this episode, I think this might be Quesh, which is a toxic planet that appeared in Star Wars The Old Republic. Quesh also had an atmosphere full of toxins that the Republic realized could be harnessed as an energy source. Chemical mines were established on the planet and the Republic would fight for control of the planet against the Sith Empire. Both planets have a toxic yellow color scheme. Both are home to mining operations and both have toxic air. Could be a different planet. It just reminds me of that one. We want to thank Geology for sponsoring this video, but also to thank them for making sure we look camera ready all day, every day. Geology is a 29 time award winning skin, hair and body care company recognized in men's health, Oprah Daily, Hype Feast, Birdie, Esquire and GQ. Geology's products use just a handful of powerful proven ingredients that have been trusted by dermatologists for decades. If you don't know where to start, Geology can create a simple and effective skincare or hair care routine for you. All you got to do is take a quick 30 second quiz. Geology can help you fight acne, reduce oilness, prevent wrinkles, combat dark or puffy under eyes, have smoother hydrated skin, and target signs of aging. Right now, if you use code NEWROCKSTARS100, Geology will give you 100% off their award winning skincare trial set. You'll also get an additional bonus offer of up to 30% off one skin, hair, or body product when you add it to your trial. That's 100% off plus an additional 30% off. That's a lot of off. Just click the link in the description or go to geolog.ie slash rockstars100 to get started. Fennec rents a hoverboat from a pit droid and the group starts traveling upriver towards Siler's location. But I really love the design of this boat. It has this little tiller arm connected to an engine that Fennec manually controls like a rudder, but the engine, I'm pretty sure it's a small pod racer engine. Maybe I just think it is because they're all pit droids, but in the Mandalorian season two premiere, Din Djarin and Cobb Vanth ride speeders that were built out of pod racer engines. So, you know, Lucasfilm designers love to just repurpose these for everything. But this whole idea of having to go upriver to find a murderous baddie reminds us of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, which was transposed by Francis Ford Coppola into the Vietnam War in Apocalypse Now in 1979. And all these stories are just really centered on navigating the boat through a murky, dangerous territory and risking losing your humanity in the process. And since Francis Ford Coppola and George Lucas and Martin Scorsese and Steven Spielberg and Brian De Palma were all buddies in the early 70s, any Star Wars reference to one of their other films or franchises probably was intended to be. Hunter and Wrecker spot mines in the water laid by Siler, and Finnick tells them to hop in the water to disarm them. After Finnick was so cooperative in The Book of Boba Fett and rendered a bit dull by the writing of that miniseries, if you ask me, I'm just so glad we get to return to her glory days when she was just a self-serving jerk. I love how mean she is this episode. And I just really appreciate the visual design of the particle filled swamp water because it contrasts the sunny tropical gorgeous Pabu. It makes Crosshair suffering in this tropical paradise an even tougher pill to swallow for him because comforts of his refuge probably make him hate that he can't enjoy it even more. Like in the state with the tremor, he'd probably prefer to be in the swamp with the others. Crosshair is practicing on some fruits, doing AZ a favor by not making him hold them this time, but he misses. That was close. Close doesn't count. It's either a hit or a miss. Ah, we are reminded of Yoda's maxim. Try not. Do. Oh, do not. There is no try. But it's Omega who plays a Yoda role in the subplot, working with Crosshair to meditate and get in touch with his inner self. Meanwhile, Wrecker and Fennec and Hunter are attacked by these croc-like reptiles. There were some swamp gators, AKA Iguajas from Dagobah and the Super Star Wars Empire Strikes Back Super Nintendo game. And it kind of looks like them, but I'm also reminded of the giant dinosaur turtle because that's all it was called in the Mandalorian season three premiere. Like there has to be smaller versions of that, right? Fennec scopes them out using the same modified MK sniper rifle she wielded in the Mandalorian 
and, and in a cool bit of visual consistency, her sniper scope is exactly the same as it was in her first appearance in The Gunslinger in Mandalorian Season 1. The Orbesh in her viewing screen in red at the bottom reads RSJ, and scrolling up the side you see RSJ, HJK, UDT, and a couple other letter combinations. So one of these crocs leaps up onto the boat and grabs Hunter, dragging him under the water. Wrecker goes full crocodile Dundee on them, press slamming one of them back into the river. Fennec shames Hunter for not tracking well enough, and Wrecker replies that even Omega got away from you, to which Fennec taunts back, apparently she got away from you too. And Wrecker's like, oh Yeah, she's referencing the fact that Omega got taken from them and got imprisoned on Tantus. When Wrecker chastises her for working with anyone who will pay, she replies, good guys, bad guys, their money is all the same. Again, a moral Fennec Shan. This is the era of the character I'm most interested in. Hunter finally tracks Siler to his hideout, and he and Wrecker move in while Fennec hangs back as a lookout. But while it seems like she's being lazy, they fight Siler, who then slips down through a trap door and tries to escape, just to find that Fennec had already sabotaged his getaway boat. So it's actually part of her plan to send them in first. Siler fights back, spewing some phlegm on Wrecker, pulls out a knife, but they're able to take him down with four stun blasts. Just as a comparison, CX2, the clone assassin, took three blasts to stun in Season 3, Episode 7, so Siler was a little tougher than the modified clone assassins. Meanwhile, on Pabu, Omega is teaching Crosshair how to meditate. Her technique, she says, was taught to her by Gunji on Kashyyyk. Gunji is a Wookiee Jedi youngling who had appeared in Clone Wars prior to Bad Batch, but we did see him in Bad Batch in Season 2, Episode 6, Tribe. But we never saw Gunji specifically teach Omega how to meditate. We did see them both talking to the trees of Kashyyyk, which is, you know, kind of meditative. Omega corrects Crosshair's hand so that instead of palm down and close off, it is palm up and open. Maybe that's all he needed. Fennec tells Wrecker and Hunter that she doesn't have their info on hand, but promises to get it for them after bringing Siler to her client. And she calls this client in the final seconds. They were asking about the Empire's M count bounties. What can you tell me? I'm sure you can track them down easily enough. Now, I know I speculated Cad Bane before, and Boba Fett is out there somewhere, but again, would probably be too young. That garbled response sounded a bit female. I think it is Asajj Ventress. It's gotta be her, right? We're over halfway through the season, and next week's episode is called The Harbinger, and that preseason trailer was so stoked to reveal Asajj Ventress is coming back with her black coiled snake pauldron and her yellow lightsaber, since she is aligned neither with the Empire or the good guys right now, serving as a bounty hunter collecting M count bounties. Sounds like something Asajj would be into these days. Let me know who you think this is in the comments below. Big thanks to Noah Chen for helping write this breakdown. Follow me, ADA Voss. Follow New Rockstars. Subscribe to New Rockstars for breakdowns of everything you love. See you next week. Thanks for watching. Bye.